me and my background, I am a trustee for the Christian climate charity Operation NOAA. Uh, I'm based in East London uh, and I'm a writer, I'm a communications consultant, and I'm also co-leader of Citizens UK's Just Transition campaign. We're here in London, we're working to, uh, with the mayor's office, Mayor City Khan, to try and create 60,000 good green jobs and apprenticeships. And we're also trying to retrofit, which is to say insulate, about 100,000 uh, what we call fuel poor homes. These are homes that uh, people struggle to pay their bills and decide whether they're gonna eat or heat. Uh, and so um, th that's one of the big campaigns I'm also working on. So that's just a little bit about me. I, I'm married to Vanessa. Uh, she is a Church of England priest here in East London. We live next to the church. So I know the whole vicarage thing and I've lived the life uh, mm. and, uh, and lived the campaigning life. So. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen, and again, I'm going to take you into a divestment, and I'm going to use the Church of England as a kind of case study for divestment and some of the work we're doing at Operation Noah around that. I'm hoping to inspire you uh, that moving money is a really important part of addressing the climate crisis, and I'm hoping to make that a little bit exciting and a little bit sexy and engaging for you tonight. If I could say that word, can I say the word sexy, John? I don't know, that was a bit, sorry. Uh, but let me share my screen and uh, show you what I'm talking about. Okay, everyone can see that, I hope. And I'm going to put that on slideshow. Okay. What is, I'm going to start because I know people have all kinds of backgrounds here, and so we're not all coming from the same place on this. So I'm going to try and speak to different levels of knowledge on this issue. I bet there are people in the room that know more than I do, uh, and you can add to this, I hope, when I'm, when I'm finished. Um, but really, basically, what in the world is fossil fuel divestment? What am I even talking about? On the most basic level, I'm talking about taking money that's currently invested in fossil fuels and moving that to an investment in climate solutions or renewable energy, okay? Moving that money out of fossil fuels. Why would anyone do that? And why is that helpful or interesting? Couple of things. One of the things we do when we divest money, when we take it out of fossil fuels, is we do something really fancy called removing the social license of the fossil fuel industry. Now that's a very sort of sociological way to describe really what we're trying to say is, it's not okay to invest in this stuff. As a society, we wanna to get to the point, a bit like we got to the point with tobacco, where we said actually <clears throat> smoking isn't a great thing. Actually, we know some people do it, but it's not something we wanna promote. Actually, we don't want people smoking in restaurants. Actually, we don't wanna see adverts on television for smoking. So this is kind of, we're shifting the narrative and we're shifting the public view about what fossil fuels, uh, what we think about fossil fuels. The other really practical thing we do when we move money out of fossil fuels is we make it more expensive and more difficult for fossil fuel companies to do new projects, to access capital. We make the financing more expensive, and we make it harder for them to find investors. And I hope to show you tonight that it's working, but reserve your judgment. Let me see if I can make the case, okay? Um, here's something really interesting. Last year, a huge report was released called the Invest Divest Report. It found, this is incredible, that we're now at the point where $39.2 trillion in assets under management are no longer available to fossil fuels, okay? That's as if the two biggest economies in the world, the US and China, got together and said, we're not gonna invest in fossil fuels anymore. Uh, so this is a global movement that's really changing the game. And who's involved in it? Well, I want you to look at the right-hand side of the screen. And at the very top under that colored wheel, you might be able to make out that it says, faith-based organization 521. And the next one down is Educational Institution 220. So if my math's right, more than twice as many as any other type of institution uh, making divestment commitments are faith organizations, churches, mosques, synagogues, other faith groups. So this is a really positive faith-based story, the divestment story. 
and what's happening around the world. You might say to me, okay, Cameron, hold on. You know, I bet you use fossil fuels. What are you getting so mouthy about? What's the problem? Okay, well, fossil fuels, first of all, they, they literally fuel the climate crisis. I've got that in bold there. Okay, when we burn oil, gas, coal, uh, these things amplify what's called the greenhouse gas effect, which warms the planet. And we now know there used to be a debate about the degree to which humans were causing global warming and climate change. But actually, we now know with the same level of certainty, we know that smoking causes cancer, that the warming we're seeing, the dangerous levels of warming we're seeing is unequivocally the result of human activity. And these planet warming activities, which again, primarily driven by burning fossil fuels, not entirely, but primarily driven by burning fossil fuels, cause more wildfires, flooding, sea level rise, droughts, all kinds of stuff we don't want to see, okay? You say to me, Cameron, we need fossil fuels. That's nice, I agree, but we're gonna need them. Okay, let me dial that back for a second and tell you, uh, 2021, the International Energy Agency, which is the big global authority on energy, said that we now need to stop all new oil and gas developments. So anytime you hear about Shell's looking at a new development in the North Sea or BP's looking to do this, that's a problem because the International Energy Agency says, actually, we've got enough oil and gas from existing developments, from ones that we're currently drilling in, than we can even use. We got way more than we can even burn and still live in a habitable world, okay? Um, in fact, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and this is a group of experts who release reports every number of years, uh, and they look at all the data. They look at the best peer-reviewed research, and then they release reports. And they've said that for the world to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, and this is the magic number, because if we tip over 1.5, some really bad things start to kick in, and it, and it all goes, goes a bit pear-shaped. Um, but they said for us to limit it to 1.5, we've got to effectively cut carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions in half uh, by 2030, by the end of this decade, okay? So that's a tall order, uh, especially when you think about emissions are already, uh, st they're still going up, okay? Emissions are still, still going up. People might say to me, hold on, Cameron. All right, I'm tracking, but what about the price of energy? You know, it's got really expensive, and if you're like me, we've noticed it, our energy bills, you know, and we use ecotricity and we've got solar panels on our roof and our energy bills have gone way up. Well, if you talk to a lot of the experts, not necessarily the politicians, but if you talk to a lot of the experts, they will tell you that new oil and gas projects will probably only worsen the problem. First of all, uh, they're not gonna be online on, you know, they're not gonna be pumping out oil and gas for, a number of years, so they'll have no impact on short to medium term bills. But we know that a lot of the oil and gas that this country domestically extracts is shipped abroad to the highest bidder because they don't have a statutory responsibility to sell that to the domestic market. And even the UK business minister, Greg Hans, admitted it's the global price of gas that sets the UK price. So, really, the last thing you want to do is get us further addicted for more years to a system that's already causing a lot of problems and is quite volatile in terms of price. So to lower energy bills, what's the consensus? Really the consensus from experts is, you've got to invest a lot more in insulation. We've got to insulate British homes. That's a really uh, quick win, not cheap, but quick win that could save a lot of carbon and help a lot of people who are struggling with their bills. And we need more domestically produced renewables. Never mind the, the geopolitics right now, which we could get into about Vladimir Putin and some of the people who run petro states and have Europe and other people literally over a barrel uh, because uh, they need the energy, that they, the, the fossil fuels they supply. We don't want to have to deal with that. Okay, so there are, there are also uh, national security reasons why you might want to get off fossil fuels pretty quickly. What's the reality versus the ambition? So on the left, we've got ambition. And if you can see that, you know, the fossil fuel companies love to show you 
uh, wind turbines, uh, windmills, you know, they love to show you that. Um, you will find that on most fossil fuel companies' web pages, they spend a lot of their time talking about that sort of stuff. The reality is every major fossil fuel company plans to increase extraction and search for new uh, fossil fuel reserves. The very thing that we can't do, the, the exact thing we can't do. Um, you say, okay, Cameron, you and your climate buddies are just kind of giving me one side of the story. Well, I mean, this just came out the last week or so, a, a major uh, study, uh, academic study, actually showing that <laughs> there is no indication from the major fossil fuel companies that they're shifting away from fossil fuels. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that more in a minute. This was Pope Francis to oil company executives. Uh, you know, that last line, he says, civilization requires energy, but energy must not destroy civilization. The story gets worse, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I, I haven't turned the corner yet, so we gotta, we gotta push into this a bit further. Um, oil companies are also lobbying against climate legislation. Um, and The Guardian had a piece talking about how much they spend uh, lobbying. And in fact, we know last year, ExxonMobil, one of the biggest uh, oil and gas companies in the world, uh, was caught on camera by Greenpeace activists, some of their top executives admitting that they work behind the scenes to kill climate legislation in the US. And in fact, they did. Joe Biden <laughs> tried to get a climate package through Congress it's dead. It's not moving anywhere. And the little, I read a, a kind of insider, Washington DC politics insider newsletter, and right in the crucial week of that legislation being considered by Congress, every day of that newsletter, it said at the top, sponsored by ExxonMobil. So there you go. Fossil fuel companies lobby UK government for gas compromise ahead of COP26. So just before the big Climate, UN climate change conference in Glasgow, uh, we had fossil fuel companies whining and dining uh, U UK government ministers uh, and trying to say that gas was a bridge fuel when we know that gas actually is really damaging and a huge carbon emitter and something we need to get away from. What happened at COP26? If the fossil fuel lobby, if that industry were its own country, they would have had the largest delegation at COP26. They had over 500 people there, okay? So expenditure on fossil fuels versus renewables. You might say to me, Cameron, okay, you're being a bit hard on these guys. We know they're not great, but they're our best bet. And they're the ones who are gonna build out our renewable energy infrastructure. Well, as of 2021, about, this is slightly ticked up from what it says on the right, but about four to 5% on average of fossil fuel companies' capital investment goes towards renewable energy. So fossil fuel companies, they spend a lot of their PR time <laughs> showing you things like that on the left, reimagining energy, doesn't that look good? Okay, then we've got, I think we've got some extraction there, but we've also got the windmills and we've got the solar farm. But actually what they spend most of their time doing 95 plus percent of their money is on extracting oil and gas. Um, it's also the ecological damage that fossil fuel companies do. So BP, for example, they're planning to drill for fossil gas at the edge of the world's largest cold water coral reef just off of Senegal. Um, you know, that could have devastating impacts. This is our friend, uh, Rachel Mash, if anybody you know, any of you know her, uh, John and I actually were, um, she was a mission partner of ours when John and I were, were uh, at church together in Edinburgh. But um, Rachel Mash, an amazing woman, and she leads Green Anglicans. Uh, it is a huge global group of Anglicans uh, committed to working for environmental change. And uh, they're primarily focused on Africa because Rachel's based in South Africa. And she says fossil fuel companies see Africa as the next frontier for gas and oil exploration. Land rights being ignored, water supplies threatened, environmental protection laws flaunted. And it's the destabilization as well that's really troubling in Africa from the fossil fuel companies. This is um, Ernesto Manuel, who's the, the Anglican Bishop 
uh, in northern Mozambique. And he says, you know, um, yeah, that, that end of that first line there destabilizes communities. Ernesto Manuel's pointed out that in areas where there's prospecting for gas in Mozambique, there's violence. Um, and he's pleading, he, he literally says, we plead with the international community, take your money out of fossil fuels. There's also, and, and this is a tough sell at the moment because fossil fuel companies are reaping extraordinary profits and some of them have announced record profits, in fact. Uh, the head of BP joked the other day, a couple of weeks ago, that BP is now a cash machine, that they're making so much money. This at a time when millions of people uh, could go into fuel poverty because of their high energy bills. But, so investors are still making some money off of fossil fuels, I don't wanna mislead you, but there's a big problem. It's something called stranded assets. And a lot of people are worried about it, including Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of England, saying, get out of fossil fuels now, because a lot of these assets, which the company, these companies haven't written off, they're not gonna be able to be extracted if we wanna have a livable world. And the value of these things, once we hit that tipping point, that renewable energy tipping point, and we start to electrify lots of things, people will be amazed how quickly the value will drop. And it will cause a lot of problems uh, financially for people. Uh, does divestment work, Cameron? Well, Shell thinks it does. <laughs> in, the, in 2018, they said, uh, you know, if divestment were to continue, it could have a materially adverse impact on the price of our securities and ability to access cap capital markets, okay? That's from Shell. German researchers, again, this is just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's the first empirical academic study from a German university, this is from a German university, University of Augsburg, that found uh, divestment actually works. It actually uh, helps bring about lower emissions. This is something else I was talking to you about. When we divest, we make it harder for fossil fuel companies to access capital and to afford to afford that capital. And uh, this was in Bloomberg, cost of capital spikes for fossil fuel producers just late last year. Um, just a week or two ago, John Ardell, VP of exploration for ExxonMobil said, you know, we won't run out of oil and gas resources, but we, will, we might run out of funding to develop them. Okay, so that's from the head of ExxonMobil or the head of exploration. Here's a face you might recognize, uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, he says divestment will send a positive and hopeful message, okay? He's, he's advocating this. He's saying, we need to do this. You say to me, Cameron, who else has done it? Methodist Church has done it. United Reformed Church has done it. Lots of people have done it. Quakers, Church of Ireland, uh, Church of Scotland, Church of Wales, Baptist Union, but Church of England, uh, still invested. Uh, there was a Guardian article a joint project between the Guardian and the DSmog researchers just this week that came out. And I hate to say this, but it showed all of the fossil fuel ties that the Church of England has, including the head of its pensions board, who is the former CEO of, B of um, Shell Canada. Um, well, here's, here's what's going on. Two, two of the Church of England's three national investment bodies, the church commissioners and the pensions board, still have 55 million in fossil fuels. And only seven of 42 Church of England dioceses have divested. So we've still got a number of Church of England dioceses uh, invested in fossil fuels. I love that Claire's here. I love that you're in Bristol because I want, to, want you to see that name up in the good books, in the green, leading the way. Thank you, Bristol Diocese. Full divestment commitment, showing how it's done, along with Durham, Truro, Norwich, Worcester, Oxford. And get in, solder and man. Who says yeah, you can't have an impact? Anybody can have an impact. You're not too small. Um, but my diocese is down in the red, uh, Chelmsford Diocese here, which covers Essex and, and parts of East London. We've brought a resolution. We're trying to make that happen. Uh, brought a re resolution to our deanery synod. There's another de de deanery synod that's bringing a resolution to say we need to divest. And then in the middle there, kind of amber, marigold, butterscotch, whatever color that is, uh, these, these are dioceses that, that actually don't have any fossil fuel investments, 
but we need them to step up and make a public commitment to say, we're not gonna do it in the future because it's the right, it's the ethical thing to do. We're not gonna invest in the future. Um, grassroots action. We've seen amazing grassroots action with Operation NOAA on the divestment front. Uh, we've got a divestment working group. We've got uh, listening training that we've been running so people can run listening meetings in their local church or context or diocese, uh, taking action both at a diocesan level and a national level. So dioceses can divest and even local churches that don't have any fossil fuel investments. You know, mo most local churches just have a, a current account uh, if they're lucky, and, uh, but they can show solidarity and join one of our upcoming global divestment announcements. We do these big global divestment announcements and we get covered in the Times and we get covered in the Guardian and we do it with faith organizations around the world. And your church could be in that list with a bunch of big pension funds and other groups if you wanted to be, to say, we're showing solidarity, we believe in divestment and we support this movement. So um, I'd love for you to think about that. Uh, this is what happened last year. And I'm almost done and then we can get to Claire. We can all relax because you'd be like, wow, Cameron was a bad warm up act, but I loved Claire. Um, 72 faith institutions just before COP26 divested. Okay, this was the biggest joint divestment announcement from faith institutions ever. Uh, we did it with our partners, Laudato C, which is formerly the Global Catholic Climate Movement, World Council of Churches, Green Anglicans and Rachel Nash and a group called Green Faith in the States. Um, that was super exciting. Okay, that's me. I've got more to say about community organizing and the process and the ideas behind that. I've got more to say about all kinds of stuff, but I want to hear from Claire and I want to hear from you because you've got better ideas and there's expertise in the room. And yeah, so that's me for now. Back to you, Lucy, and I'll stop sharing. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Cameron. Oh, let me just, there we go. Thank you so much. I, I learned so much there. And I'd love to hear uh, more of what you have to say in the Q&A. So people store up questions um, for Cameron and we'll get them in the chat for, um, for after Claire has spoken. So I'm going to pass over to Claire now, who I'm sure has just as much wonderful um, things to share with us. Thanks, Lucy. And thanks so much, Cameron, for that. That was absolutely fascinating and terrifying in parts, but um, yeah, really setting out the challenge for us as churches. I mean, I think that um, if you could send around that report, that Invest Divest report, that was um, fantastic, wasn't it? That $39 trillion have been divested already from um, fossil fuels, which is absolutely amazing. And to see that the faith sector is, is leading the way in that is just so inspiring. So yeah, really, really encouraging stuff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Diocese of Bristol and our kind of journey to divestment. I'm going to try and not talk too much. As you may have heard, my voice is a bit shaky and I have got a cold, so I'm hoping not to <laughs> cough and splutter at you too much. But um, I'm the part-time DEO for Bristol Diocese and I have a background in climate campaigning as well, working with Christian Aid and the Climate Coalition which is a network of charities working on climate change. And I'm also a member of Hazelnut here in Bristol. It's been a real joy to see the community grow over the last year or so and see so many familiar faces on this call as well, because um, it's just a fantastic example of how the church can respond to the climate crisis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the Diocese of Bristol made a divestment commitment last year and some of the process running up to it, as well as some tips and um, touching on what Cameron was saying uh, for churches to do the same. So as you have just seen on the slide there, the Diocese of Bristol is one of 42 churches in the, in the Church of England, and we were the first diocese to declare a climate emergency back in November 2019. And then um, become, uh, we also became the first diocese to um, commit to being net zero carbon by 2030. And then following that, um, other dioceses and the national church followed. But I think it makes sense to talk a bit about the net zero commitment first, because that came first and it set the scene for some of the conversations around divestment. And interestingly, as we're thinking about community organizing, it was a very bottom up process. It was basically a group of volunteers in the diocese got 
fed up with the fact that the diocese wasn't doing anything really on climate change. So they gathered together in each other's living rooms and put together a um, environment policy that then they put up to our diocesan synod that raised the profile of the, of the issue um, and was passed. And at the same time, one individual church, um, which is Cotton Parish Church in Bristol, they uh, passed a motion at their parochial church council, so their PCC, to declare and recognise a climate emergency. And then they then brought this motion from their parish up to their deanery synod, which is sort of the regional grouping of churches in the C of E, um, and then asked the synod to declare a climate emergency, which they did. Um, and then the deanery brought the motion up to the diocesan synod um, in the, about a month or so later. Um, and then that was passed unanimously. So it was from one individual church that meant that the whole diocese um, became the first in the country to declare a climate emergency. And three months later, our diocesan representatives went to General Synod, which is the National Parliament of the Church of England, and then brought for a successful amendment forward, which meant that the whole church brought their decarbonisation target forward by 20 years. And there was a lot of forces at play there and there was a lot of prayer supporting the process and a lot of people who have around the country have been campaigning and working on this for a long time. But it is fair to say that in a matter of months, one individual church's climate declaration had a domino effect that led to all that change. Um, so don't uh, don't think that you, what your church does doesn't matter because it can really have an influence on um, on sort of church politics and and the wider world. So in terms of our divestment decision, that sat within this context of having already made ambitious environmental commitments. So we'd already publicly declared that it's a state of an emergency, and that kind of helps wheel the oil the wheels sort of behind the scenes of conversations about well what are we going to do about this. So first we. As part of this um, divestment work, we worked out what our baseline carbon equivalent is of our investments. So that's looking at what investments that we had in fossil fuels, but also the carbon um, intensity of investments in things like manufacturing and aviation and stuff that isn't just fossil fuels. And then we submitted a divestment proposal to our diocesan finance committee. Um, and everything, everyone, every diocese has one of these. And um, there was really strong support for it in principle, but then there were some concerns around the practicalities. So people were asking, well, what if we publicly divest and then we find that one or more of our funds have gone ahead behind our back and acquired some fossil fuel holdings without our knowledge and then it's egg on our face and, and all of these sorts of questions. And do we have any guidelines about how to sell them and in what time frame? So there was a lot of this detail to, to work out. So we invited our investment fund managers into the conversation and said, um, well, will this happen? Are you going to go and buy stuff behind our back? And they said, no, we won't. If you don't want us to invest in fossil fuels, we won't do it. So we agreed as a committee that if that ever were to happen, we would sell those holdings immediately. And then we immediately agreed to set, arrange the sale of uh, very small remaining holdings in fossil fuel companies and agreed an ERIS foundation principle for divestment, which excludes any companies that derive more than 10% of revenues from the fossil fuel industry. So that's... Um, I mean, it means that we, we could, in theory, have um, investments in companies that have like a 5% revenue from something that is related to fossil fuels down the line. But I think that the ERIS Foundation principles tend to be the sort of standard um, approach that means that you can pretty confidently say that, um, that, you, that you're not invested within your knowledge. And Operation NOAA were so hugely helpful in providing advice and clarity throughout that whole process so that we were kind of clear on on what we were saying and um, and just confident that we were able to kind of publicly then announce that. And since then, we've been working and supporting Operation NOAA to help sort of spread this message around other dioceses and encourage them to divest. So I've had a couple of conversations with some of my equivalents around the country about how to go about it and what to practically put in place. And last year, um, some of those dioceses on the list there, so Sodor and Man and Truro. I think Truro is on, has divested and they're not on the list, actually. So that's another one. I think there's eight now. So that's good. And, um, and Worcester as well have all, have all divested um, as a result. So it's been really encouraging to see the kind of the dominoes start to topple. Um, but there is still a lot to, to do in terms of the national church bodies, as Cameron was saying. So we've got... Um, 
the national institutions um, like church commissioners that are still invested. But I think the good news is that they have said that they will um, divest from any company that has shown that they aren't on a net zero transition pathway next year. Um, so by in 2023, there's a there's a big campaign to be had and a lot of lobbying to be done if those institutions aren't keeping to their word and they're retaining their investments. Um, so there may well need to be some mobilisation there if um, if the national church doesn't stick to its word on that. But if it does, then by the end of next year, the national church um, should be joining that list of other churches and faith institutions that are divested as well. And it was really encouraging to see the stats of um, how many faith groups came together in that pre-COP announcement. Was it 70, 74 um, faith groups? 72. And the fact that over half of those were in, from the UK as well just shows that um, the campaign in the UK is really gaining gaining momentum and building strength. Um, and yeah, it's sort of setting a, a principle for other, other countries to follow. So in terms of um, individual churches, I mean, Cameron touched on this as well, and I'm sure we can have much more conversation about it, but um, not all churches have investments, um, but all pretty much have bank accounts, and some do have investments, some do have other kind of restricted funds for um, building works and all the rest. And um, we can e easily move our bank accounts to an ethical version. I think the co-op has the only high is the only high street bank that offers a fossil free current account. But there are others like CAF Bank and um, Triodos, which are based here in Bristol, um, that do as well. Um, and when it comes to uh, moving your investments, Operation Noah have produced a really fantastic guide. And I can send you in the chat the um, link to that. And it's called uh, Divest Your Church How To Guide. And it talks you through every step of how you go about divesting and then communicating that. Um, so I'll just put that in the chat now so that you can take a look at it. Da, 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 da. Um, and that's just a, a really helpful tool um, to, to, to make that step as a church. And I think that it's important to set any divestment conversation within your church, within the broader kind of moral imperative of the climate emergency, because as people of faith, we're called to care for God's creation, aren't we, and to be good stewards. And so part of that is to ensure that we're not doing harm to our world, either directly through our actions or indirectly through our investments. And I think that there's just a lot of um, lack of understanding and lack of knowledge within a church of what of what your investments and what your money is doing and so by opening that up and being more transparent and giving everybody a say um, is actually quite an empowering move anyway as a church um, to help people to feel like they're they're able to respond to what is otherwise quite a big um, daunting prospect of like responding to the climate emergency what does that mean but this is one really really uh, practical step and I think once that argument's made, the conversation becomes much more about the practicalities of how to divest, not about whether to. And it makes the process so much smoother. Um, so it's it's you, you kind of don't need to have that argument because it's already it's already sort of um, a done deal. So I think that's all I wanted to share from um, the diocesan perspective and uh, happy to take any questions or, or have a wider conversation. Thanks. Thank you, Claire. Um, I am just going to try and... It, has it gone back to gallery view for everybody? Or yes, no, no. If it hasn't, maybe just click in the corner. I've unspotlighted everyone, but you might be on speaker view now. Um, as there aren't many of us, I think it would be um, nice to have a conversation now rather than um, a, a standard Q&A, because I'm sure there's a, a wealth of experience here. Um, please be aware of this is being recorded, so if you'd rather not be um, recorded in the conversation, feel free to either stick it in the chat or turn your camera off or whatever you're, you're comfortable with, um, and I'll, I'll keep an eye on the chat and ask any questions that you have. Um, but does anybody have any initial thoughts or questions or responses to what Claire or Cameron have shared? I'm happy to kick us off if no one else does. Um, I, I'm interested to know, um, in it's great to hear about faith communities and faith organisations divesting. Have you seen much, um, many examples of or have any advice for um, sort of partnering with secular organisations, councils, 
um, that kind of thing as a, as a local church or as a Christian community. Claire, I don't know if you want to take that. I've, I've got some ideas on that, but uh, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, I mean, we, we have, as Operation Noah, we've partnered with uh, groups like UK Divest uh, and, uh, and other divestment organizations around the world. So uh, what's really interesting is there's a real appreciation in the divestment movement for the role of faith communities. Uh, the secular divestment movement really gets that this is a powerful, um, you know, that, that faith institutions, whether or not they agree with them on lots of things or understand them there's there's a sort of secular understanding that faith institutions have a moral uh authority they have a you know i think something like 80 plus percent of people around the world are part of a faith institution or uh, part of part of a faith community of some kind um so i think there's a real understanding and there because there are such deep roots deep faith roots in divestment um like i showed on that that graphic uh, I, I think it, it, it's really possible for churches to partner with these groups on these issues. Thank you, Cameron. Great question. Um, I heard one, I can't remember where I heard this, but I was in a meeting somewhere with someone who's a financial person. And they said they had kind of an argument against diver, divestment. And I'd be wondering to hear what your response is to this. They said, and what has happens though is when, say, a diocese divests, all of those shares are then made public, and rather than being held by, say, a diocese who's concerned about them, they're just being snapped up by other um, conglomerates and investment companies that have no kind of uh, nobody is watching how they invest, and so it's actually worse for us because they're just continuing to get sold on. That was, I can't remember where I heard that, but that was something I heard. And I was wondering how you would address that or what the, what would that, what the answer to that be? Yeah, I can say a bit to that. So that, that is kind of the main argument really that um, you should engage with as a stakeholder rather than divest. Um, and I mean, I think that if you're working, if you're a stakeholder of a company whose main business isn't extracting fossil fuels, then there may be some credence to that. Um, but in reality, if you're a stakeholder in Total or Shell or BP, then that is their whole raison d'etre is, um, is to extract and ex explore for, for fossil fuels. And so you're never going to get them to stop doing that. Like we've seen, haven't we, that even that, that, that um, Cameron was sharing that stat of 3% of their total business um, is on renewables. And that doesn't just include renewables, that's carbon capture and storage as well. So that's not even investing in new renewables. Um, so they're, they're, not, they're not going to shift because of a, a tiny holding from a diocese somewhere or a church somewhere. And it has much more weight if you take that moral stance and say and pu very publicly say that this is a toxic brand, we shouldn't be investing in it and we all need to be moving our money. Um, and that's gonna have a much, much more of an impact than um, speaking up once a year at an AGM for it, when it's a lost cause. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Claire, Claire nailed it. And I'm glad you used that word, Claire, toxic. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to do, John, is to make these investments toxic. And again, the thing we often talk about as well, and, and uh, Claire mentioned uh, Truro Diocese. Truro Diocese has, has not only taken money, their money out of fossil fuels, but they've, they've uh, got two million pounds approximately now directly in a fund that's directly investing in renewable energy. So I think the other thing to say is that, you know, um, we, we, can, we can shift the game better if we direct those funds towards building the alternative to what the fossil fuel companies are doing. I mean, the other thing we've often said to the, to the Church of England's church commissioners who have made this engagement argument time and time again, is we've said, show us evidence that it has ever worked. It's never worked. Emissions continue to go up. I mean, the best thing that the church commissioners can point to is that they got a few new um, people on the board of Exxon, uh, but it's made absolutely no difference nine months later uh, in terms of Exxon's plans, in terms of where they're headed, it's made no difference. So um, if I saw any glimmer <laughs> that it actually worked, I, I might, I might be less critical of it, but um, but you're right, John. That that's often the argument that's made. 
That was one of the most revealing things in your talk, really, for me, was um, understanding. I think I was brain, I've was brain. i been brainwashed into thinking that these energy companies are going to, you know, they are reinvesting huge amounts of money into green energy, but obviously that's not really the case. So, hmm. It's, I mean, Claire, you, you probably could say more about this. I mean, you, I thought you put it really nicely when you said, you know, the, the problem, because engagement has worked in other industries, but the problem is you're asking companies whose only thing, like the only thing they do and where they've got all their money is in fossil fuels and the kit to extract fossil fuels. And you're basically telling them, write a lot of that off and start doing something else. You know, I, I always say, I mean, this is a slightly absurd example, but I always say, you know, I could invest uh, in a weapons manufacturer and hope they start making toasters because, hey, why couldn't they? But they're a weapons manufacturer. <coughs> That's not what they do. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think there are some smaller energy companies that are investing more than the that tiny, tiny paltry amount. So I think the SSE is one of them, which is like Southern, oh no, Scottish, anyway, I can't remember what this is, it's a British owned. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're putting a significant amount of investment in. And um, there and there are others as well. And I think particularly some of the Scandinavian owned ones that get a lot of government funding, they re really are transitioning, but they're very much in the minority. And it's when you're talking about these massive um, conglomerates and, and, and multinational companies, um, like those big names that we saw on the screen, I think that that's where, um, yeah, you get such tiny proportions of their investments that are going into, into renewables. Um, if I may, I, I find it strange that um, we seem to be concentrating on the, the supply side, getting the supply side down. And yet, uh, despite the increase in renewables, um, emissions are still going out, up, which makes me think that there's pressure on the demand side somewhere. So um, you can maybe uh, do something in terms of attacking the, the uh, supply side, but if the, the demand side doesn't come down, then there's always going to be um, an economic pressure for someone to buy into fossil fuels and keep producing. So um, is anybody looking at what is creating more demand? I mean, okay, <laughs> Uh, it could be um, air conditioning or something in some parts of the world which may need it badly, but uh, um, are, are we getting pushed into buying things all the more that we don't really need and are energy intensive? Should we be divesting from <laughs> advertising agencies or something? <laughs> uh, well, I know that uh, Bitcoin, for example, the sort of digital currency markets uh, use an enormous amount of energy. And there's been a lot of chat recently about that, uh, how damaging Bitcoin is to, uh, to the world uh, because of how much energy it requires. So that's an interesting conversation. And I still don't fully uh, have a sense of the, the totality of it, but I know that's a concern. As, as a, um, as a uh, master's in computing, um, I look at Bitcoin and I think, what does it actually create? I mean, Tesla actually builds factories to make electric vehicles, but Bitcoin is, to my mind, it's some sort of scam mm -hmm. because it's not actually creating anything except a way to somehow make more money as fast as you can. Well, you know, it doesn't do anything mm -hmm. except pretend to be a currency which you don't spend on something because next week it's going to be worth an awful lot more. So it can't operate as a currency. <laughs> mm. And I think Clive, you've hit there on the, on the, the, the heart of the issue with um, the nature of consumerism in society in general, most of what we are consuming and most of what energy is going towards producing is useless. You know, the fashion industry it's a huge contributor 
um, to, to the environmental crisis at the moment. It's huge, uses a huge amount of energy um, and also puts loads of plastic back into the water systems and all that kind of stuff. Um, and what does that achieve? You know, buying three three new items of clothing every week, which is like an, an average for a certain um, age age group of, of women in this country, and I forget which age group, but three new items of clothing a week, that does nothing. Um, but I think that's it in general. The way we um, we are as a society is so based on consumerism that we're not, and even when we're producing, we're not actually producing anything. So in terms of demand, we can all do something, can't we? we, we we're all... Um, capable of consuming less um, and I, I'm probably preaching to the choir here <laughs> we're probably the people who are trying our hardest um, but yeah I think you're completely completely right mm. I'll jump in here on, on that from a permaculture perspective because it's part of the garden thing so the the permacultures would say it's a waste issue so when we over consume we create more waste and waste is the over consuming of kind of um energy or things like that. So if you take a, a forest, for instance, if you look at nature, there's no waste in a forest. So everything, even a tree falling down and strong winds begins to break down, begins to be a place for a fungus, uh, a habitat for things, and there's no waste. So it's we're unique as humans in that we create this amount of waste in what we do. So I do think there's something to look at nature as a way of thinking about um, how we consume and the waste that we produce and how we begin mm. to think about creating communities that are um, um, kind of based on this permaculture principle of creating less waste by living a more holistic um, life, which is, I think, something that hopefully Hazelnut is wanting to continue to explore and, and create friends and collaborations around that. The, there's two conversations that might spring out of this. One is obviously the one about church facilities being net zero and I'm sure there's quite a lot of material on that or it wouldn't wouldn't be hard to access but are we aware of um, best practice for community farms uh, and, and those kind of things we on our uh, we have quite a large allotment seven plots um, and uh, we're trying not to use peat we're trying not to use any kind of chemical fertilizer um, and, you know, there'll be quite a list there, but I'd be interested to know if anything's been published or there's a web page or, or, or whatever that people are aware of that talks about best practice uh, ecologically on our community gardens. Um, uh, you know, echo toilets, wood chip for the paths, all that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, if I take this one, I, I will put a link up in just a second. There's quite a lot, especially when you start looking in the permaculture kind of um, stuff, there's, there's, it kind of addresses that, and, um, quite a, but there's an article that is really solid from one, that's on one of our um, friends' websites. So I'll put the link up now, just as we discuss this. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dave, as well. If I, I don't know, can you, yeah, you can hear me. Um, Dave, we read, um, me and my husband, we read a magazine called Permaculture Magazine, which I know John reads as well. And there's a whole YouTube channel on it as well. And that's sort of, I knew nothing about gardening maybe two years ago, <laughs> but I've absorbed a lot of information just through just through reading the magazine and the online stuff. Um, and it is all those things that you've just mentioned of the, the ideas about the peat, but it's, it's kind of digestible. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd recommend that that magazine as well. It costs a little bit, but I think the online stuff is free. Great, thank, thank you. you. I would say as well, just as an encouragement, um, is I feel like that those of you who are involved in Potting Shed and exploring um, Christian communities focused on around community gardens and, and community um, farms is, that in itself is saying to the Church of England and the, and the church in a wider sense, um, you don't need a building with a very expensive new sound system and all of this, you know, material stuff put into it to develop um, a community that's doing what the church is meant to be doing. You know, we can do things with far less resources. And, and in itself, we're speaking truth to power in, in, in doing that. So I commend those of you who are um, running with that already. It's, it really is very inspiring. Mm. I think in our local uh, environments, political environments, social environments, um, 
it's also uh, a way of drawing like-minded people mm. uh, into coalitions mm. uh, because if we do something uh, we we have authority in the soft sense of that uh, word within our communities and we're finding that very much on our uh, project uh, food poverty network uh, permaculture discussions um, they're using our venue to host some of the meetings um, um, and so it it has multiple impacts mm. as well as being a good thing that should be done it, it draws you into conversations with a very diverse group of people definitely that's great dave just to to pick up on that i think that's a brilliant point um i went to a conference a few years ago uh with stanley howard Voss. it was my wife and i and stanley howard Voss and about 40 other people i have no idea how we were there but um uh, it was called the church as politics mm. and i really had to think about that for a long time sort of investigate that what do they mean the church as politics and we talked about the church as a moral community that, that made, you know, moral decisions. Right. And, and that's, you know, we can create as church a new type of politics whereby, as you're saying, we come together, we do things, right. we have authority in the sense of that we understand the things we're caring for and doing. Right. And then we can go out into the world and, you know, bring a message of, of hope and transformation. So I, I really like the way you said that. Thank you. Mm. Psalm 103 uh, is great. Uh, it says about us being crowned with love and compassion. And in the Bible, headgear does actually mean something. And so it often denotes authority. So being crowned with it, um, and it goes back to the whole servant leadership thing, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. His authority is coming from how he relates mm. to people, not merely the, his title as the creator of the universe. Mm. Mm. Back to um, best practice. What's people's experience of a viable, um, not too expensive alternative to a polytunnel? We don't want to produce plastic. We want to do all the, you know, get away from you know, and, and, and often compost arrives in a, a plastic bag. How do we address that? The first thing you said was inexpensive, I think. That was the thing that hit me. And the, the, the uh, something's inexpensive if you pay for it once and it lasts the rest of your life. <coughs> but if, you, if you're going to replace it every two years, then even if it's cheap, it's going to be expensive. So... You need to you need to factor that in to begin with. Mm. I mean that's why I've spent a lot on a greenhouse, which hopefully will last me the rest of my life, mm. and withstand hundred plus mile an hour storms. So it's either an act of faith or an act of idiocy. But there we are. Mm. We're having that exact question at the moment, Candy, as well. We've got um, we're in a, in quite an we're in an, an urban area uh, where there is a lot of. Um, uh, destruction of property of other people's property shall we say so a greenhouse just isn't viable for us because it will get smashed um so we, we're, we're thinking exactly the same thing we want to get a polytunnel um but we're not you know we're not sure it's the most environmentally friendly thing we're also not sure it won't also get destroyed and uh, we've been looking at um cold frames um which again i'm not sure if anyone's got any better ideas than that i'd love to hear if anyone does in terms of compost as well, you can get, most councils do a, a delivery of topsoil and compost. Um, so we do that, so it comes in a big truck and it just gets dumped, so that avoids the plastic issue and it's cheaper. Though I would be careful about uh, councils, sometimes they're just yeah. from a, not not from a, just from a quality perspective. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it's not a very high quality. Yeah. I, I, I mean, one thing I'd say about- isn't, isn't trustworthy. I mean, I've had some, I've collected it myself and I'm still sifting out the bits of plastic when I keep coming up to the yeah, top yeah. that uh, after I use it as a mulch and this is down, it's down years ago so I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole to be honest. <laughs> I think only here in Bristol we've um, gone away from, we've gotten more bulk delivered in larger bags and they're still kind of like a made of a plastic but we keep them so it's not single use 
Um, mm. And so, which I think is the same, I would say about a polytone is that it's not a single use, we're not throwing mm. away. Um, mm. But we, what we do is because we do, do no, no digs, so we've like um, had a couple of beds that um, are on our site that have not been looked after for a long time by the previous people. So we put them down as ground cover over the winter and weighted them down so they can kind of kill back weeds. And so we'll keep them all for that use. So they actually serve a use rather than just being used and going into the bin. That's one thing that we've tried to do. And I, um, yeah, I don't think we've purchased any kind of single bags just because of that very reason. If you're trying to, and if you're trying to garden at any type of level, then you use that. But even if you bought, if you're on a small garden and you buy a bag like that, the other thing you can do is you can club in with others to buy bulk bags, which can sometimes be better as well. I think one of the things that I just, when we're thinking about like community organizing, one of the reasons why we're talking about this and we could make a little shift in the last maybe 10 minutes here, because um, I think um, one of the things I've been really um, thinking about around divestment is that um, if I could be kind of blunt, because I really believe in divestment. I think it's really important. I really think net zero is important. But I feel sometimes like we that um, if, if, for instance, I'll use Church of England, where I'm in, is it they've, they're waking up to um, ecological issues, but they put they're so focused on net zero that it's sometimes I feel like they're not able to see other things that are happening as well that is involving community organizing. Um, living differently, community gardens, things like that. And it's a lot of times maybe people in boardrooms or people higher up making quite large decisions that you're not necessarily a part of. That's why I do love what, what Claire was saying about the fact that a PCC or community group. And I like to see, think of, um, especially our community gardens as places that collectively can have a voice that can speak up. So I know, Cam, you're doing loads um, and, and Claire both have a history of that kind of community. Can you guys talk about how a small voice can join together to kind of create a roar um, on some of these issues. Cameron, do you want to say a bit about citizens? Yeah, sure. I can talk about citizens. Um, so our our church uh, here in Walthamstow in East London, we um, we are the founding members of what's called Waltham Forest Citizens, and Waltham Forest Citizens is part of London Citizens, and London Citizens is part of Citizens UK. Uh, and what, what community organizing is in our context is it's, it's churches, mosques, uh, synagogues, uh, colleges and schools and, and community groups coming together to listen to each other, to work out what are people uh, angry about, upset about, worried about, and, and what do they want to change? What are they willing to do to make things, make a difference and make things change? Um, so in our context, it's community organizing is really, it's about listening to, to a diverse group of people around issues, making those connections between what are the stories we keep hearing again and again that come up? And then how do we build power to hold politicians to account to make sure that real change actually happens on the ground in our communities? Um, it's a whole different way of doing church. We've tried to even implement community organizing principles and how we do our church, how we run our church. Um, it's a lot around listening. It's a lot around one-to-one -one conversations, which is a very structured, Claire has probably done these, very structured way of having conversations with people. Um, and you know, Claire, may, maybe you could say more about, about um, your experience with community organizing, but yeah, but, but with us, it's about listening to what are people wanting to take action on and then how can we build power to, uh, to make that happen. So for us, it's about like affordable housing. Uh, we, we're working on air pollution issues. We're working on, like I said, our Just Transition campaign. Um, there's refugee issues in London that people are you know, coming together on. So, so, that's, that, so that's just a little taster, but Claire, say, say more mm. about it. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think that, that that listening exercise and that building of relationship is so key because any change that you can create together has to be through a place of knowing each other and being in relationship with each other. And churches are perfect places for that to happen and for us to get to know each other better. And it has so many benefits for the churches as well as for what the for your community organizing more widely because it helps you to um 
sort of develop a vision together and um, take more take more responsibility on so it's not the same group of people trying to do everything trying to like distribute some of that power um and i think some of the perhaps more difficult things from an organizational perspective is that actually you're giving you, you have to relinquish control because individuals will then um identify what things are on their hearts and on and, and that you need to that they want to focus on and so you can't be I think that's often the ch churches can be quite top down they can say oh, well this is what we're going to be doing this year but actually you, you have to relinquish control of that and say well if we're going to be really listening to people and really building relationships with people then we need to be led by that um and I mean I think that from a an, from an eco perspective as well eco church is a really helpful tool to uh, encourage churches to start on that journey because um for those of you who are part of eco church it's got five different areas of thinking about your environmental footprint but one of those is around local and community engagement um so there's a on there it's, it's sort of survey led so you've got sort of surveys and um, that give you suggestions of things that you could be doing to improve in those areas and um that community and local engagement piece um is often actually where churches say oh we've that we've got a a silver award for buildings and we've got uh, bronze for land but we don't have anything yet for um community engagement because they they just aren't doing those things and so it's a really good prompt so um to, so i yes yeah, the citizens link is already there so that's a really good place to look um but also have a look at eco church because that's a helpful tool to help your church to engage in in this area as well and uh, claire just to pick up on what you said i really like that claire's exactly right it's about this is why churches sometimes struggle with community organizing because churches are used to saying we got a new program everybody uh here it is we think you're gonna love it we've not really talked to you about it <laughs> but we're rolling it out we're pretty sure it's gonna you know we're pretty sure you're gonna like it when actually community organizing is about listening first and we and out of the listening then comes the campaign out of the listening comes the program uh, and just to give you a really quick story about the most powerful experience we had with organizing was about four years ago. Our alliance here in this part of East London is about something like 14 institutions. Um, what we did was we held an accountability assembly for our local councillors, particularly the, the two people running to be leader of our council. And we developed a manifesto after having hundreds of conversations with people in our institutions we identified about five issues, we did our research, and we then made asks that we thought were winnable, that we thought we could win. We put that in the manifesto. We had pre-meetings with both of the potential leaders of the council. They both said no to almost every one of those issues. We then invited them to an assembly where we had 700 people, and they looked terrified. And at that assembly, they agreed to every single item on that manifesto. We got it on video. We had photos taken with them afterwards. We tweeted about it. We then made a point to meet with them a week later. You know, you, when you build power and you build it across diverse communities, politicians don't know what to do with it. They've never seen anything like it. They're used to divide and conquer. We can deal with this group over here, and we know who Hazelnut Community Farm are, and we know who these guys are, and none of them talk to each other, and we can just pick one off at a time and go, yeah, 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 we'll get back to you. When you are, <laughs> if you can get, if Hazelnut Community Farm can work on an environmental project across diverse communities in Bristol, and you could get 700 people, and you could get a leader of the council there, things are gonna start to happen you're going to start to be seen as a power player and things can change. So that's all I'll say. <laughs> At an entirely practical level, if you've got a local project, uh, think about your community space actually on the site. We've got two places where 20 people could sit down and two other places where 10 people could sit down. And th those that listening and all those other things, although theoretically we could do it in the church, the, the building that we hire and all that, coming right into the middle of our our project, seeing all the things that we're implementing, and then having conversations with people, um, it is very powerful. But the lady from um, Ashburnham and Arusha who talked about planning your plot, 
this is part of your planning your plot but where is the community space where the community organizing can take place and it won't always be possible but it might often be possible to make sure you've got that it all boils down to cups of tea and coffee and yeah soft drinks of your choice and you know well and, and i told you the most exciting thing most community organizing happens in small spaces so it happens with small conversations sometimes one-to-ones sometimes meetings of six or seven people uh, that was one of our partner organizations that had a huge space that we could use. It was actually um, the Muslim, uh, local Muslim council that let us use their space. So there, and they were, they were there, they brought their people. Amazing. I think we have to uh, wrap it up there because we've gone past quarter past. Um, but thank you so, so much to Claire and Cameron. Um, I really I feel like I've, I've learned a lot, taken a lot in this evening. And thank you to everyone else well. I thought we've really engaged well with this topic and it's been a really rich discussion um, at the end as well. So really lovely to see you all. Thank you for joining us.